Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the October meeting of the uh, Infrastructure Investment and uh, Inclusive Growth at Scrutiny Board, the name of which continues to expand like Topsy. Um, I'm sure everyone is now fully versed in the, the fine arts of Zoom and the speaking uh, hand indicator, so I'll not mess about with, with that. Um, so getting into, before we get into the agenda, I'd quite like to go around and ask everyone individually to introduce themselves, because we may well have members of the public watching our proceedings, and obviously it will assist them to know who's who. So going through the board membership, I'll go through the officers uh, at the appropriate time on the two agenda items for which you're attending. So the first on the list is Neil Buckley. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Neil Buckley, I represent all Woodley Ward. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Lou Cunningham. Morning, everyone. I'm Lou Cunningham, one of the Armley Ward councillors. Councillor Neil Dawson. Uh, Councillor Neil Dawson representing Molly South Ward. Thank you. Uh, Katie Dye. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Katie Dye. I'm councillor for Killingbeck and Seacroft. I'm not sure that Jacob has yet joined us, but if you have Jacob, shout up. No, I can't see you anywhere on screen. Um, I think the same applies to Ron. Uh, so move on to Camilla. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Councillor Camilla Maxwood representing Gipton and Hare Hills Ward. Thank you. Um, I don't see Councillor Shazad either. So moving on to Councillor Taylor. Good morning, Councillor Jonathan Taylor, Horsworth and Rawdon Ward. Thank you. Paul Wadsworth. Good morning, Councillor Paul Wadsworth, representing Geisy and Rawdon Ward. Okay, and I'm Councillor Paul Truswell. I, I represent Middleton and Belle Isle, and I also chair this scrutiny board. So, moving on to the agenda proper, uh, agenda item one appeals, I'm not aware of any. Agenda item two, exclusion of the public, that's not applicable. Late items, there were none. Declarations of interest, speak now or forever hold your peace, but I'm not aware of any. Um, apologies, we've got Martin Farrington who may have to leave at 12pm. I hope we might all be joining him. Um, Andrew Hall and Gary Bartlett is, is taking his place. And ha Alex Horby from Transdev. Okay, if there are no more apologies, I'll move on to agenda item six, which are the minutes of the last meeting held on the 23rd of September. Um, I think somebody might have got their mic on. There's an echo. So if everyone could ensure that their mics are muted, please. So Chair, going back to the minutes of the Chair, 23rd. Is... Take... Sorry, Chair, I'll just take this moment to say um, Councillor Shazad is trying to get into the meeting. OK, thank you, Lou. Cheers. Right, go, going back for the third time to the minutes of the 23rd of September. Um, in time ordered fashion, I will go through them page by page. Please shout out if you've got any amendments or corrections or any matters arising. So, page five, this is. Page six. Uh, yeah, can I just ask a quick question about page six? Of course. Um, I know it appears later on the agenda, but the, there's a statement towards the end of the bullet points in the first paragraph saying that member concern regarding school children and students trying to get to classes on time was noted and would be raised with Wiker. So I just wanted to check that that was done. OK, was that done? It, was, Ma it was Martin that was taking that away. So I'll check for you, Councillor Dye, and, um, and confirm one way or another. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so if there are no other matters arising or corrections on page six, I'll move on to page seven. Page eight. Page nine. Page ten. Yes, page ten, uh, Chair. Fire away, Neil. Yeah, the, the third bullet up, um, reference to Morley train station and the improvements there. 
Um, I still haven't seen anything about confirmation that this is part of the Transpennine upgrade or any update on that. I just wonder if that can be followed up. Okay, well, if no one's in a position to respond to that here and now, yeah, we, we can follow that up in due course. Okay, moving on from page 10 to page 11. Okay, if there's nothing on there, our board members content for me to sign these as a correct record when and if I'm physically able to do so. Yeah, I don't hear any dissent. That takes us on to agenda item seven, which is the latest of our frequent discussions on our advancing bus provision um, scrutiny inquiry. Um, obviously, <laughs> this is quite an organic discussion and we can't shackle ourselves to recommendations that were made four years ago. And clearly at the moment, much of what we've discussed in the past has been overshadowed and overtaken by COVID. And we do actually have a presentation from Dave Pearson from Wyker that focuses particularly on that. Um, so really, I think our discussion on this part of the agenda needs to be in two parts. One is the COVID element, because that is here and now and really pushing so much else out and delaying so much else. And then we'll go on to the wider recommendations and the updates contained within the report. If for no other reason, then we have to actually give it a, a pass mark or whatever as part of the ongoing scrutiny process. So before I ask Dave to start his, uh, his presentation, uh, I'd like to run through the ever burgeoning list of uh, guests that we've got. It's almost been like Cecil B. DeMille um, directing a cast of thousands. I will st so we'll start with Councillor Mulheron because she happens to be first on my list. So Lisa, could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Councillor Lisa Mulherin, RZ Robin Hood Ward, um, Executive Member for Climate Change, Transport and Sustainable Development. Thank you. And then we've got Councillor Kim Groves. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Kim Groves, Director Member for Bell Island Middleton and Chair of Transport, we Shortage Combined Authority. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Gary Bartlett. Thanks, Chair. It's Gary Bartlett, Chief Officer for Highways and Transportation at Leeds City Council. Thank you, Dave Pearson. Hi, everyone. Uh, Dave Pearson, Director of Transport and Property Services at West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Thank you. Um, and do we have Andrew McGuinness? Yeah, morning, Chair. It's, uh, Andrew McGuinness. Ah, sorry, CPT. Andrew. Thank, yeah. thank you. It's okay, Chair. Uh, CPT Regional Manager for the North of England and Chair of ABOI, um, the Bus Operators Association. Thank you. Uh, Dwayne Wells. Hey, everyone. Dwayne Wells, Head of Commercial for Arriva Auction. Thank you. Paul Matthews. Good morning, everyone. Paul Matthews, Managing Director for Bus in West Yorkshire. Thank you very much. And uh, Alex, I think we've got apologies for, haven't we? Yeah. I, I, hi, Chair. I, I, I don't wish to say apologies for being here, but I am here, so there's no need for my apologies now. So, um, <laughs> more, more than yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I I've, I, I've, 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 uh, I've been slightly misled, I think, here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Someone will have to be shot at dawn for that. Right. OK, well, thanks very much for all those introductions. Now it's over to Dave. And I think Becky, Dave, is going to be sharing your presentation any second on screen. Is that right? And in the meantime, welcome to Councillor uh, Mohamed Shazad. If I, Mo, as we've been going through introductions, I just wonder if you want to just take the opportunity to introduce yourself. Hi, Mo. Hi, uh, it's Councillor Mohamed Shazad from the... I think my mute's yeah, you, yeah, it's Council Mohamed Shadad from the Mortana and Meanwood Ward. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, fine, yeah. Cl loud and clear, Mo. Okay, sorry. So back, back, back to Dave. Let the presentation begin, please. Okay, um, Becky's just sharing the screen, so um, I'll uh, 
I'm sure you should be kind of to move the, the slides on as, as I speak. I, I'm just going to get a little bit of context and background um, to to the discussion we're about to have, and then um, Councillor Groves will will then come in um, and and just put a but a, a bit of context as to particularly how we're seeing things now and, and where we want to 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 take things in the future, um, and then obviously we we can. Um, we, we can answer any questions and, and deal with any issues that, that members have, but it's for lots of reasons in lots of ways. This has been a very, very different year that, that we're dealing with in, in public transport as well as in life generally. Um, and I think it's important to start with, with as the chair said at the, uh, at the outset, um, the impact that COVID is having on public transport and the particularly way in which it changes the landscape a little bit around public transport. I thought it'd be just useful to start there. So if Becky, you could bring to the next slide. Um, I think what 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 this is doing, um, the two graphs, um, the, the top graph is is basically how bus patronage has performed since since towards the end of May when um, when some of the economy started reopening again. Um, and you can see in that graph at the top, a steady increase in, in bus use across West Yorkshire, almost week on week from May through to September, then a bit of a higher increase in September as the, the schools and colleges go back. And then that's sort of leveled out a little bit now. Um, but but it's leveling out at around a, just over 50% of, of the, the numbers of passengers we would expect to be seeing on buses at this at each time of the year so um so essentially what what we've we've got is is about half the number of people who are traveling on bus than we would normally expect um and and, and i think this this graph sort of illustrates that uh, fairly effectively um i think the other thing to bear in mind and we'll come into it in a second is that social distancing essentially halves the capacity of each bus. So um, buses cannot uh, carry their full uh, licensed number of, of passengers because uh, we're making precautions for social distancing in line with national guidelines. The second graph at the bottom is smart card use. And I think it's just useful to illustrate um, uh, how that graph's gone from the levels that we were looking at in, in March to, to where we are now. Um, the, the two two lines, the the darker line, uh, essentially concessionary bus passes, predominantly uh, the the older and disabled people's free bus passes, um, and uh, the the lighter line being uh, M card, smart cards, and and what what that graph tells us, uh, which I think is is probably self evident, is that you know essentially in March um, bus use dropped like a stone. And it's slowly grown back, um, and it's grown back um, a little bit stronger with the with the free bus pass users um, than it has with the M card users. And what that also tells us is that the M card users are predominantly commuters going to work, um, and in in our towns and city centres, um, that uh, that the, that's the part of the bus market that's uh, that's slow, been slowest to move. If Becky, you could give us the next slide, thank you. And that sort of this slide more or less confirms what we've just been saying. Bus services reduced quite a lot between April and June to a key worker network, and then slowly but surely they've been reinstated back to back to normal essentially from September onwards, plus the additional buses that uh, that, that that are needed to to get children to and from school and, and students to and from college. So we broadly have 100% of the bus network and half the people travelling. Um, and so there's a there's a financial gap that that, that brings, um, and that gap's been been plugged uh, at the moment financially, uh, both by the government paying an additional grant to both bus, bus operators and transport authorities, um, and uh, and and also the local transport authorities, including the combined authorities, um, essentially paying bus operators what they would have paid them regardless of of. The, the the fall off in passengers um, and, and the reductions in service in the earlier part of the pandemic. So so a financial equilibrium stability has been uh, achieved for 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 now, um, and we'll come on to what that means in the longer term. Um, so essentially, the, the 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 financial hole is being plugged, but 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 uh, but only for the the uh, the, the duration of, uh, of the temporary funding. 
where we also are is um, that we we're in a, a place where um, buses are just about full at certain times of the year. Um, and one of the things which we need to reflect on is that when we get to that 50% to 60% of apaptions we saw on the graph, um, then at certain times of the day, particularly in the late afternoon when schools and college students are, are going home and, 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 and people at work are going home as well, is that um, there is a risk at the moment that, that some busy bus journeys are leaving passengers simply because there are more passengers than, than, than are needed to, um, for, to, to be accommodated on social distancing. Um, we're working very closely with bus operators to try and get the buses in the right place to minimise that, but, but it, it is something that's, that, that's an inevitable consequence of the fact that, particularly in the late afternoon, um, the, we've got the, the most active sort of demand, uh, predominantly driven by schools and colleges. So what this slide is doing is, is, is basically looking at the different scenarios as to what happens next on, on funding, because funding is, is key to this. As I said, funding is propping up the bus service at the moment um, and, uh, and, and how that funding plays out over the current, current um, period of, 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 of lockdown restrictions, but also beyond that. Um, so if, if things on the first scenario more or less continue as they are now, um, then we'll still have the service levels, we'll still have the capacity constraints. Um, that, that graph at the beginning will sort of flatten out. Um, but what, one thing we should bear in mind is that there will be a long-term impact on travel behaviour. People are already changing their travel behaviour um, and some of that will be short-term because of the pandemic, some of it will be longer term. If the public sector funding into, into bus comes to a premature end um, in whatever form that means, um, then, um, then essentially the, the bus industry will need to level out at a, a level of costs that meets the, the revenue that's coming in. Um, and all businesses have to do that. That's, the, that's their, their obligations as businesses. And what that, that means is that if, if the um, funding is withdrawn too early, then we could be looking at withdrawal of services. We could be looking at job losses in the bus industry. Uh, I think that's, that's a, a, a concern that we all, we all have is that um, if, uh, if government sees that the end of social distancing is the end of, of, uh, of, of the emergency funding for, for bus, then we, um, I think we're fairly clear that, um, that the bus passengers will not return in exactly the same numbers as they were travelling in 2019 and, uh, and there'll be a, um, a funding gap to bridge going forward. And so that's our, our position to government is very much, um, this is probably a two year recovery period. Um, and we've had some analysis done and others have had similar analysis done. And that tends to be the, the general consensus is that um, emergency funding needs to, needs, needs to be there for the recovery after COVID uh, restrictions are, are lifted um, so that we, we, we stabilise the, the financial position of the bus service over a long period of time. So we've made a proposition to government. Um, based upon um, a partnership working that we've we've had with, with bus operators through the pandemic, and it's been good level of co collaboration between the pan uh, through the pandemic between ourselves and bus operators, um, that uh, the the emergency funding that the government is is directly putting into the bus industry should be devolved to uh, regions such as West Yorkshire and managed jointly with with the bus operators. So, if Becky, you could move to the, the next slide. Um, I think we should recognise also that there are longer term implications of COVID. Um, uh, I think we, we're all used to reading articles and, and, and talking to colleagues around um, will people's uh, working patterns, particularly those who work in, in city and town centre offices, change for the long term? Um, and is that going to reduce the amount of people commuting? And if that reduces the amount of people commuting, that takes some of the um, uh, the, the people who are paying the most to travel on bus out of the, the bus network and there's an economic effect. We're, we're, we're heading into or already into an economic recession caused by COVID, unemployment, affordability to, to travel to work is going to be a massive, massive uh, it, it thing to, for us to deal with as we, we try and get people back to work and we try and get the economy back moving again. Um, 
shopping habits have changed online uh, uh shopping is that what what implications are that for for our our retail centers um and one of the things that is quite interesting through all the pandemic that we've noticed on the footfall in our bus stations is that footfall in and our busy bus busy city centre bus stations or normally busy city centre bus stations like Leeds and Bradford has been a lot slower to return compared with the um, the, the local centres like Castlefield, Keighley, and Dewsbury, um, where where we've seen people coming back to those town centres quicker, um, and that's an interesting little thing that that says are we actually looking to um, that the, the network is is less centred on large a population and, and, and city centres and 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 as much about people making local journeys um, than uh, than longer distance journeys. I think there's a there's an ever present risk that people's response to 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 the health impacts of COVID is to, to use their car more and, and that obviously will will impact badly on on on, on our clean air and on our, our climate uh, carbon reduction objections objectives. But but also I think people's use of public transport is going to be slightly different and people will perceive cleanliness and um, overcrowding as being as very, their, their tolerance of those things are going to be very different coming out of this than they were going in. And I think the other other thing to, to bear in mind is that um, the, the, uh, the, the whole impact on financial impact on, on buses uh, has the risk of slowing down investment in, in newer and cleaner vehicles. Becky, should we move to the next one? So that's all fairly doomy uh, sort, of, sort of prognosis as to the future. Um, but what I did want to do is just to, to give a, a little reminder that actually whilst um, we've been in some of the, the sort of severe lockdown and some of the restrictions that have, have uh, are taking place, we are actually working quite strongly to, to bring back a, a, a modernised, um, uh, improved bus network for the city um, and in particular the Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme construction work has gone on a pace in the city centre particularly around the head row we've started work uh, in Corn Exchange it, there's been work going on in the Firmware Street Park Row um, we're about to do to start a project early next year on the bus station and we've also got live projects in, in a number of different local centres to improve bus waiting facilities, including Bramley and Middleton. Um, some of the work that's been doing is to, is to improve bus journey times. Uh, and there's lots of work on the Hunslet Road, as, as many of you will know, as well as the, the corridor between Leeds and Bradford. Um, and that's, it doesn't just stop with, with the Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme. Um, there are longer term plans around the, the city square around the area around St James's Hospital and, and, and further expansion of park and ride. One of the things we, 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 we were planning to do anyway, and we will, so we will emerge with a bus service which in Leeds, which has a new colour coded system for helping people get around. And that's particularly focused at people who don't regularly use the bus service, um, that uh, we'll have a colour coded scheme for, 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 for bus services. Um, we'll have more real-time information displays in the city centre and on the, on the corridors and in local centres so that people can can um, can can work with and understand how to use a bus better is, is what we've been trying to do. Lots of investment in new buses, two-thirds of the, the new buses that that, uh, that that are factored into the, the public transport improvement programme are actually out in operation. Um, uh, I, I won't um, take first colleagues as uh, thunder, I'm sure that they, 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 they can talk about the, the new electric buses, which I think started operation on service five, which is a city centre loop yesterday. Um, and we've got new services to and from the airport with new branded uh, and more direct services to and from the airport. Um, and a certain park and ride will be an all, all electric park and ride with electric buses when that opens next year. Um, we're working um, when it's, uh, when it's appropriate to encourage more under 19s to use the bus, we've, we're working on a fair deal, which we hope to be able to announce in a couple of weeks time um, to uh, encourage uh, more under 19s to, to use the bus and, and get that sort of bus habit uh, amongst uh, younger people. Um, and we're very mindful of the fact that uh, a, as, as office workers in particular may be moving to, to a, a blend of home working and office working, that they're going to need different ticketing products. Um, and we, we launched this month uh, a, um, a, a new app 
um, where people can buy tickets um, and we will um, we will start promoting that app towards the end of this month um, and we believe that's the first time people have been able to buy bus and rail tickets on an app um, so we, we've been working a lot in the background to um, to basically emerge from this in, in a stronger place in terms of bus service and and if, if we want to move to the next slide Becky um, I think we sent this out with a um, with the pack um, this is what our color coded bus network is going to look like um, and, uh, and and you'll start seeing these around uh, the city uh, from later this year and so by early next year it'll be quite obvious on on bus stops um, as well as uh, as on, on all our online um, sort of assets that, that how, and we particularly the, the problem we're trying to solve if you like uh, or, or what the, the thing that I always point to when we talk about this is if somebody arrives in Leeds and needs to go to St James's Hospital on the bus um, it's quite a challenge to find to work out how to do that now um, and we need to make it easier for people and and this this is this colour coding network is, is is to trying to do that. So I'm going to hand over now to Councillor Groves just to just to take us through uh, so where we want to take things next with us. Actually, be, before you do, Dave, I noticed that very early on in your presentation, Councillor Buckley indicated that he wished to ask a question. So I'm going to give him that opportunity and then I will move on to you, Kim. Okay. Neil. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Chair. It was just two very brief questions, actually. And um, uh, thanks to, to Dave for that, because it was very clear and um, it, easy to understand. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, he referred to the LP tip schemes and um, uh, <clears throat> designed mainly for um, bus priority and, um, and so on. And I just wondered, there are several schemes across the city which have been uh, put on hold. And I understand the reason for this. It's all to do with the um, finance window coming to an end next year. But I just wonder whether it will be helpful. Um, I may have missed it if this has been published. If so, I apologise. But I wonder if it would be helpful to let us have a list of the schemes on LPTIP which have been deferred. So that's question number one. And question two was... Uh, he referred to the um, passenger levels going up to about 55% or something like that, compared to what they were uh, before the virus. And I just wonder whether the figures were out there to split that between the commercial bus routes and the ones which are supported, because that obviously just has a bearing on cost. So just those two questions, Chair. Okay. I, if... Chair, if, if I can answer Councillor Buckley's second question first, and uh, I might ask Gary to help with his first question. Um, uh, I think that the, um, the, the impact of, of, of passengers uh, and passenger numbers uh, has been fairly uniform across commercial and, uh, and, and supported bus services. For, 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 the, for, for other members who, who might not be quite as familiar with this, um, the, the combined authority uses local taxpayers' money to, to, to across all of West Yorkshire to, to basically pay for about 15% of services um, and, and they operate under contract with the combined authority. And they're, they're predominantly those services which are needed because there's no commercial case for a service either to that, uh, that area or, or at that particular time of day or, or night. Um, and and we, we look very carefully at, at the value for money of those services. Um, and when, particularly in the in the um, period where we uh, we had the, the service reductions because of the, the the lockdown provisions, you know, we tried to target as much as possible the services which the, the combined authority paid for to um, to journeys that people needed to make for essential work reasons in particular. So um, so we did we did that. I, I think. I think it's across the piece, to be fair, that the, 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 the patronage is down. Um, and I think one of the things that, that is noticeable, both on bus and on rail, um, is, is that the, um, the, the bus patronage built back up fairly strongly during the summer, um, accepting the fact that it's still, you know, it's still very depressed in terms of uh, the number of people traveling around um, because of people observing, you know, working from home, et cetera. Um, but bus actually has bounced back quite a lot quicker than rail. Um, and that's been an interesting observation that we've seen. Um, and I think what that sort of tells us is that 
the the key element in the public transport market that isn't there are the regular commuters into major towns and cities um, and it, it, the, the, the office workers in particular um, because the retail workers obviously are at the shops but but even even retail is is, is more lightly staffed in some cases than, than it is normally so um, so I think that's the area that we're seeing the, the greatest sort of suppressed demand at the moment in terms of Councillor Buckley's question around schemes um, uh, the, the, lo the public transport improvement program came with a number of, of conditions. One, obviously, it was finite sum of money. Two, a finite period of time to actually um, deliver those schemes in. And 2021 is is the, the last year for that scheme. We also have the West Yorkshire Transport Fund, uh, which also is funding schemes in Leeds um, uh, that's running in parallel, and that's that's running to different timescales. Um, and we also have the Transforming Cities Fund, which is the newer. Um, set, set of, of government funding, which is is coming, uh, and, and the, the Leeds Public Transport Improvement Programme was a, was a sort of forerunner of transforming cities fund as a as government funded uh, transport schemes. So there is an element of moving some schemes in and out, um, and some schemes that uh, that that were um, originally in the in the the, um, the the Leeds Public Transport Improvement Programme. Um, have been moved alongside to, 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 to make sure that we deliver, deliver and maximise the spend on, on the time limited, cash limited money we've got in Leeds. But I don't know whether, Gary, you want to add to that? Thanks, Dave. Uh, I think what I would say there is that uh, we're preparing a report for November's Executive Board on an update on Leeds Public Transport Investment Programme. And uh, one particular piece of information that we're seeking to provide is a list of the schemes that have been completed as part of LIPTIP, the, the long list of schemes that are on site, the schemes that have been uh, funded by other sources we've managed to um, achieve, and also the schemes that remain unfunded that we continue to approach DFT about. So um, the executive board coming up in November, we intend to collect that information under those categories so that that can be made available very shortly. Okay, thanks very much, Dave and Gary. Now, over to you, Kim. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll make it pretty um, brief. Um, so given the impact of um, the pandemic on public transport and the passenger new numbers, our urgent priority is to protect the network and make it as, as attractive as possible for uh, as normality returns. Um, we continue to press the government to give us greater freedom to pursue all options of um, delivery on the bus. But it certainly is um, challenging times. So our, our aim remains, you know, that West Yorkshire and Leeds deserves a first choice bus uh, network. And I want to sort of thank um, Council Mulher and the portfolio holder and the officers of Leeds because the investment in Lipti had we not had the pandemic, I believe, would have shown the growth in patronage through the shorter journey times for people. And, you know, the investment is fantastic. And it's been held up as an exemplar right across um, the country as the Liptic programme. So our actions and next steps um, at WICA is, um, we obviously know that actually people talk about public ownership, but registration rules that aren't. Um, we've had to react quickly for a proposition to go into government um, ahead of the spending review and the bus strategy. So we've asked to devolve um, funding to the combined authority um, and use this to commission services and to engage with bus operators through an enhanced partnership. Um, we're also working on the transport recovery plan on rebuilding and adapting networks, a new ticketing project and invest in low carbon. We're developing a business case for the wider bus reform within the government um, strategy. Um, so they're ongoing pieces of work. We're obviously in challenging times and uh, we have to react um, as quickly as we can to anything that emerges out of COVID. And the school transport was um, cha challenging, but working in partnership um, we didn't have many problems from that. Um, however, the funding is on a cliff edge 
um, and we really do need to secure some sort of uh, deal from government. Just quickly what an enhanced partnership would deliver. If we establish an enhanced partnership between the CA and operators, this would give the combined authority greater influence over a broad set of requirements. This includes ticketing, rules, fair zones, routes and branding. Um, it would cost us legally to get this partnership going, but we believe that the proposition that we've put forward on behalf of the leaders of West Yorkshire is the right one at this time. So I'll leave it there, Chair. OK, thanks very much, Kim. Um... I'm going to give our colleagues from the bus operator sector the opportunity to contribute, if they so wish, don't feel obliged. And just to help, I'll take you in the following order. Um, Paul, Dwayne, Alex and Andrew. So, Paul, I don't know if you want to say anything from, um, from the first point of view. Obviously, we've had the wider presentation in general terms from Dave, but if you want to give us a specific perspective from your, your neck of the woods. I think that would be helpful. Thank you very much, Chair. And, and I, I, I certainly don't want to repeat what Dave said. It was a very, very thorough and very comprehensive presentation, um, which I would, would certainly would endorse. I think two words stand out for me over the course of the last six months. It's been collaboration and agility. And uh, uh, I think Dave has, has demonstrated the collaboration and I would emphasize that, which has been probably the strongest it has ever been between operators and the combined authority, but also the need to respond to not just what was happening around us, but certainly to respond to the government guidance, which was, uh, as I'm sure the council have faced, was almost incessant in terms of um, demand for service levels, demand for additional safety, risk assessments, demand for ca capacity movements. So it has been um, pretty relentless. I think the, the only thing I would add, perhaps, or two things I would add, one is where we have perhaps been a bit agitated locally, and I think this might play out in any further movements in, in lockdown tiers, is around messaging um, on public transport. And, and certainly we were very concerned initially, of course, about um, the message or the inference that traveling by bus was unsafe um, in terms of avoid public transport which clearly it isn't unsafe because of the measures that have been put in place. And so um, um, I think thankfully that message soon changed to, uh, um, to uh, um, only travel if necessary, et cetera, rather than avoid public transport. But I say the, the sensitivity around messaging is so important that we get it right locally, obviously in, in responding to whatever the government say, because this is our long-term future that we don't want to deter future travel. And so getting the messaging right now is so important. I think the final thing I would say is around staff. And we can't forget that the staff that we have who've had to work throughout the pandemic and, and therefore are class, I think very much as critical workers, they are not immune to what is happening in the communities. And, and therefore, I mean, even in this, this second wave, if that's what it's classed, across West Yorkshire, we've currently got 36 staff out of about uh, close to 2000 with positive cases and all the inference uh, uh, implication that brings us for self-isolation. So we do need to bear in mind, of course, that, that we employ a lot of people, a lot of people from the community, and we obviously need and have tried to take those staff along, along the difficult journey that we've had. So I think, Chair, that's probably all I would, I would say rather than duplicate what Dave has said, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. Moving on to Dwayne. Uh, yes, yeah, support um, Paul's comments there. From the from the reader perspective, um, very similar to, to first. Um, we've got a, a strong partnership here in West Yorkshire um, that's developed over time through initially Bus 18 and, and, and since then the Bus Alliance. Um, and I think that really has helped um, overcome a lot of the challenges that we've faced over the last, um, uh, the last six months. Um, we're still running with that um, reduced demand for social distancing, um, but working together, we've obviously got extra journeys in there to support, um, as Dave says, a, a drop off in peak time demand um, with the traditional commutes into the city centres um, and also um, normal um, flows in some cases around schools. So it's been quite a challenge to to overcome working together, um, multi operators. I think we've um, uh, we've achieved that. 
Um, I'm quite proud of what um, of what all the teams have achieved. Um, nothing, nothing further to add. Okay, thanks very much, um, Alex. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, and it's a similar story, I guess, from from Transdev. Really, I think um, I think I'm not sure what else buses and particularly our people could have done to to keep um, the region moving. I think what was notable was even though I think we're deemed as you know, private operators, um, I think you'll find that right across the UK, um, we almost moved in parallel to carry on ensuring we were there with our services, providing key links to key workers, even though there was hardly any customers there. And in parallel, the public sector, both at national and, and local level, was moving with us to ensure we had access to funding to enable us to, to fund the cost of, of operating that network. And still we are here now operating um, and, and almost waiting for, for subsidy to arrive. So we, we, are, we are trusting um, and, and actually making decisions to provide the network before even some of the decisions arrive. And I think that's an important um, thing, to, thing to make. And I think, you know, the, 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 bus, the bus system across the whole of the UK, I think, has, has done a very good showing of itself in terms of delivering, delivering that network. And that's, that's equally appropriate to what's going on in West Yorkshire. I think the ability to now recover, I think we, we have got um, a good group of people around the table in West Yorkshire on both sides in terms of um, there is keenness to, to build on what we've got. I don't think any of us are accepting of, of the situation I think we found ourselves in pre-COVID. I think we still want to improve. We still want to invest. We still want to make the network better. We still want more people on buses. And I think now even more so, we're very keen through enhanced partnerships and other means to allow us to sit around the table and design the network and do the kind of things that we couldn't do previously because of regulations to allow us to actually build build something back that was better than what was before, more efficient and more effective than what was there before. And hopefully we get some semblance of opportunity from the, the terrible situation that indeed, you know, we all found ourselves in, um, in this year. Um, and I will just say, echo what Paul says and that I think, you know, we, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to all of our colleagues who, who have come to work every day and been determined to carry on providing services when at times there was that point, um, we'll all remember in late March and early April, whereas we really didn't know what we were walking ourselves into and driving round roads and not knowing who was going to get on our buses, but it was our drivers that were there um, doing that and actually providing a semblance of normality two people with buses going down the road for those people who were stuck in needs to get out, needs to go out and get medication, needs to go out and get supplies. We shouldn't, we should, we should somehow find a way of, of, of remembering that because that's what's kept the system going and that's what will help us all get out of it again. Okay, thank you, Alex. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to first completely echo um, the sentiment from, uh, from colleagues there and uh, just to make similar points, but uh, I've scribbled down past, present and, uh, and future. So, yeah, from the beginning of the pandemic crisis, bus op bus, uh, buses have continued to run. Buses, uh, it never stopped at any stage. Uh, yes, the frequencies may have diminished. Uh, yes, there may have been some uh, movement uh, based on demand. But uh, just to echo the points from everybody, uh, bus operators continue to run providing services for, for key workers and, and the children in times of great uncertainty. Staff on the front line, not only from operators, but in the public sector as well, should be, have been recognised. I think that's been a great success story. And, uh, and the partnership approach from WICA Local Authority Operators has been fantastic and has been truly about uh, providing services uh, as and when uh, the needed. Uh, in the immediate term, uh, in recent weeks, it's all been about home to school transport. And again, that's been done fantastically well. Uh, the priority of getting kids safely to school and, uh, and that's been done. Uh, the messaging has been touched on and some of the, the national messaging certainly hasn't been helpful in the, helpful in the past. Uh, bus operators have fallen safer travel uh, guidance. Uh, there's, uh, there's risk assessment, there's enhanced cleaning. There's increased sanitising, there's use of face masks. So buses are operating in a safe environment. And I think we have to, insofar as possible, localised messaging um, really has to, uh, has to uh, put across that image of, uh, of buses being safe. 
not only for the people who uh, who uh, rely on services, but for the discretionary demand that may be there as well. I did just want to touch on the future, and I think I think um, if you look at things pessimistically, winter may be a challenge, and uh, unfortunately none of us have a crystal ball, but in the future we do look at that formal enhanced partnership, so discussions at the right place, uh, at the right time will take place on that. And also with the news on the clean air zone uh, yesterday, I don't think that we can take our eye off the ball that uh, car use, single car use has been, uh, has been rising and uh, will continue to rise. So again, buses provide the solution to continue to provide air, a good air quality. Uh, operators have invested already and will continue to in that field. The Connect and Leads programme is an exemplar in providing uh, support of priority. But again, what more can we do uh, in partnership to get people on public transport and out of cars? So I would say that's a longer term ambition and remain. So thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. Paul, you indicated, Paul was with that you wanted to ask questions. Are you on to questions and comments or have you got another operator to come in? Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, I think we've probably... No, I, th I, think, I think we can go into questions. You indicated some minutes ago, so I think that's why I brought you in. Yeah, I was just getting, I was getting in first for questions and comments to, to everybody, uh, if, if, if that's where you are. What I will just say to the operators is my casework um, since March on buses has dropped off the edge of a cliff, so you can take that as a compliment particularly Paul Matthews, because most of my services are first, and I don't think we've had one conversation, um, which has been good for both of us, I'm sure. Um, and that's, that's you know, a genuine compliment that I think, you know, you've managed to run services um, in very difficult times. Admitted that what I see on the ground is, and still see, is a lot of buses running empty. Um, but I noticed, Dave, that you are saying that the patronage is now about at capacity when we're dealing with social distancing. Um, so you couldn't manage much more capacity and where you're getting over capacity. I think the question is, do you intend to double up on some of the services where there is, where people are being left behind? In my particular area, nobody's telling me they are being left behind. Um, I think that probably comes to the fact that what we are led to believe from comments that were made by senior councillors yesterday, that traffic levels have returned to around 90%. Personally, I don't see that on the ground, but if they've returned to 90%, but patronage on buses is only 50%, you would expect to think that a lot of people who would normally have traveled on buses have actually gone back to the private car and are using the private car for journeys that they would previously have done done by buses. Um, and I think that comes around to ticketing. Some of the ticketing that you do as an expiry date, I think, doesn't it, Dave, in the sense that if you buy groups of tickets, they only last for 30 days. I think that's probably something that you'll need to think about as people are traveling possibly only one or two days a week when previously they traveled five or possibly six days a week. Um, and just a comment with regard to the messaging, um, which which Paul Matthews raised, I'm still not sure what the messaging is, so it's not getting through to me. Um, I think you'd say the messaging now is only travel if you have to. Um, I, I thought on Sunday, considered going out for a day out, and I thought, shall I take the bus and get a day rider and see where it gets me? And then I thought, no, that's not the thing to do. Um, and, and I'm not I'm not COVID um, panicking, um, but I did consider whether it was actually safe to travel on buses um, just for for pleasure. Um, so perhaps somebody can reassure me whether I should be travelling on buses for pleasure or not. Those are comments or questions, Paul. Councillor Trussell Chair. Okay, but I think you were looking for some sort of reassurance on some of the issues. I don't know, Dave, do you want to come back on any of Councillor Wadsworth's I, points? Yes. I, I, uh, indeed, I'll, I'll, any, anyone else? I, I'll come back briefly on, on, on some of those points um, that Councillor Wadsworth makes, yes. Um, I, I think that, that when we say that buses are at capacity because they can only carry half the passengers and, and sometimes they're full, that's very much a certain times of the day issue. Uh, and I think that there's uh, there is a there's a lot of activity that's going on uh, to 
to basically get buses in the right place to try and minimize that. But there is a finite number of buses and there's a finite number of drivers to be able to, to do that with. So um, so just sort of getting the they're getting the resources in the right place rather than doubling up, I think is 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 where we need to be um, at this moment in time. Um, Councillor Wadsworth mentioned ticketing and, and one of the, the challenges we've had over the whole summer period, the spring period, has, has been um, people who bought annual tickets um, and uh, and it, none of us had known when they're going back to work. Um, so what we have tried to do with the M card is to allow people to sort of defer the, the, the lost benefit and then take it later. Um, but but we we have had quite a lot of people who are um, who, who are asking for refunds, and we've tried to manage that um, that that process um, and the cash flow implications of that as best we can. Longer term, as, as Council Wadsworth points us out, points out, and I think I mentioned in my presentation, um, we 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 we've got a different level of demand that we need to satisfy, and people's travel habits are going to change, and we need the ticketing arrangements to change to to suit to suit that. I, I, I do share Councillor Wadsworth's concern, I think, about messaging, um, because I think messaging in this whole pandemic is, is, is quite difficult and, and people sometimes hear um, things within the messaging that, that aren't there. Um, and I think that's, um, it, and I think that was mentioned, I think, by Paul in, in his piece around um, you know, the fact that there was a sort of implicit uh, around avoiding public transport because it, it's a it's a risk of of, of virus transmission. Um, as of yesterday, as as of today, I think obviously because it, it came in today, but as of Monday, um, there's some new travel guidance around, um, and uh, we're in tier two in this region um, in terms of the the COVID precautions, uh, and that basically is is no more than avoid unnecessary journeys. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and that sort of really is down to individuals to, uh, uh, to make their, their own judgments um, in terms of, of what's, what's necessary. I think that the, the aim is, is really to, to reduce person-to-person -person transmission as much as possible and, and, um, and, and that sort of filters through all of society. So uh, if, um, if the region moves into tier three, um, which, uh, which Liverpool is at at the moment, then we start moving into a little bit more restrictive guidance, but it's still the guidance around travel. Um, and, and that is particularly about traveling into and out of the region, but we're not there yet. Okay, thanks very much, Dave. Um, I don't know if any of our bus operator guests want to come in on any of that. Don't feel obliged to. If not, I'm gonna move on to councillor Katie Dye. Okay, Katie. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, um, a few comments, few questions, some of it picking up on what Councillor Wadsworth said. Um, I also want to say um, that I think staff have done an amazing job and um, keeping the buses on the roads at the very beginning when it was really uncertain was really helpful. And I, I personally had people say to me they were, they were glad that that was still happening. Um, and, and I'm sure staff have had a really difficult time, particularly with the whole masks issue. Um, I, I, I know that I've spoken to people who worked on buses saying that they found that really difficult. So um, the fact that, that they've coped with it all um, is, is, is something that I think perhaps everybody says thank you for. Um, a few questions really. Uh, uh, Councillor Wadsworth talked about people possibly choosing private cars over buses. I mean, that is something that I've heard from, from certainly from people taking their children to and from school and college. I wondered if, if there's any evidence on that, that, that people who would um, before COVID have, have used the bus instead because of fears of safety or fears of not getting on a bus seeing as it's only operating at 50% at, at, at of its capacity. Um, is there evidence that people are using cars instead of buses? So that's the first one that's a, a, a proper question. Um, then to pick on, so, up on some of the things that um, Dave said, the first one is about the um, network navigation, the color coding. I think that's a brilliant idea. It's really easy when you turn up in a, in a brand new city that you've never been to before and it's got a tube or a tram system and you can easily navigate using that. So the closer 
um, we can make the buses to that, I think is, is, is brilliant. Um, so two questions around that. Will there be colour coding on the buses themselves that says this bus is travelling on the orange route or whatever? And will there be um, signage on, on screens in, inside the bus saying no, this bus will stop at, at, at key points like, for example, the, the hospital or places that people might be wanting to go? Um, and then the last one is is about the um, peak peak travel when buses are going past uh, stops full, and I have had several parents contact me about that, and I've seen it myself um, when buses are going past stops full of college students, really. Um, and I think the figure quoted was 5%. I would imagine it's those kind of times when that's happening. How's the data collected on that? Are, are buses reporting when they go past a stop and they do not collect people? Um, or is it done in another way? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Katie. Dave, we'll kick off with you, but if any of our colleagues from the bus operator sector want to chip in after that, please feel okay. free to. Um, the, the, the evidence of car use questions is an interesting one. Um, and um, uh, it, it, obviously there's, there's data collected on, on traffic flows and traffic levels, um, but there's also quite a lot of, um, of, of um, market research techniques that have been used. We, we, we're doing a, um, a, a survey, I think we've, we've done the, the, the third one of it now, about people's attitudes to travel generally. Transport Focus, who are the organization who, national organization, who's the sort of customer watchdog for transport, uh, are, are doing doing something likewise. And, and they're, they're doing, I think, a, a more, even more frequent every fortnight um, set of, of, uh, of market research, just to gain people's attitudes and to understand what people's views are. Um, and I think one thing that comes fairly consistently through um, through those, those bits of, uh, of market research is is, uh, um, is that sort of concern around travel generally, use of public transport, where the, the concern, particularly in the spring and early summer, about safety of public transport was, was quite strong. And that seems to have diminished a little bit as we've gone, gone through the summer. Um, but but there's still, there's, there are still people who are concerned um, who, and who feel that their own um, sort of... Uh, metal bubble is safer than 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 traveling around with other people and you know you can't you can't get away from that that's what people will how people will see it i think one of the things we we have sort of tried to do and government's tried to do as well is, is actually point out that actually car sharing between households and that sort of thing is, is probably far more um risky in terms of a virus transmission than than, um, than public transport so trying to sort of broaden that that discussion out and also as, as you know, taxis are now included in terms of precautions and they weren't earlier in the year. So lots of stuff going on. And I think that, but I think we, we are aware that there's a general concern in the background about, um, about travel generally um, and, uh, and people, um, people using public transport. What we have found um, in our market research is that when you ask the people who have used the bus or have used the train, um, uh, if, if they still feel like that, they generally don't. So it's, it, it's, it's, it seems to be a, if you haven't done it before, you're a bit wary of it. If you, once you've done it, it, it it's not quite, quite as bad as you thought. Um, so, so that seems to be coming through. The colour coding, um, yes, in fact, it, it, even just yesterday, we, we were having discussions with our bus operator colleagues, just finalising what, look, what, the, um, what, what, what the sign at the front of the bus looks like in terms of, of following the, the colour coding on. Um, and in terms of what's inside the bus and, and how the, the bus uh, services are, are presented, then I'm sure bus operator colleagues have, have that in hand as well. And I'm going to sort of pass on to, to bus operator colleagues to, to ask answer the question around gathering the, the information around the bus full situations and, and addressing that. Thanks, Dave. Paul, Paul's indicated that yeah. he wants to, to speak, but... I'm quite happy for any others to come in. I'm not sure how conversant you are with the hand signal on Zoom indicating that you wish to speak. So if you use that, that would be really helpful. But I guess that the thumb pull was an indication that you wanted to speak. So floor it, is yours. It, it was. 
It was. I apologise for the thumb rather than the hand. It was not intentional. Um, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, just in terms of the bus full situation, I mean, at the moment, it's just about less than 3% of journeys uh, are indicating bus full. But clearly, at certain times, it is worse. And what we do, we do use the data, absolutely, to monitor where we should uh, deploy some additional duplicate journeys um, at peak times. Clearly, we are we uh, have constraints in terms of the number of vehicles, um, but we do ensure that um, that there should not be full journeys on infrequent services. Um, in terms of how we we use that data, we use the data quite a lot these days, and the data is very rich, both in terms of dictating where we uh, deploy additional vehicles, but also on the apps now you can um, determine whether the vehicle um, in real time has got capacity or not. So we use the data for that purpose. And we also have a space checker so that customers can go online to determine whether or not it's likely that journeys at a certain time of day are going to be oversubscribed. And I know thirdly, the combined authority are looking at ways at, at, on real time systems to denote whether or not buses have capacity as well. So yeah, absolutely, we're using the data both to um, better serve the customers by, by way of information, but also making sure we put the vehicles where they need to go. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paul. Alex? Yeah, likewise, I think all, all operators now have information on their apps, so they're using the data to, to inform customers where, where buses are busy. And as Paul says, yeah, we're using that to inform schedules. I think the other point to make is these situations of full buses You'll, you'll find that we're tracking it daily. So we're, we're, we're looking at where the full buses are every day. It's one of the first emails I know I receive. And, and, and you're talking, you know, less than 2% of all journeys. It's, it's a very small number. And indeed, then we're using that information to then react the next day and the days after that to then, to then put, put extra buses on where we can. As Paul says, we're also working in, in conjunction with the coach sector. The coach sector is one who's seen, obviously, its, its, uh, its business almost vanish. So we're working in a number of places with the coach sector to, to add extra, extra vehicles to duplicate um, ones, particularly around school times. That's, that's specifically something that's happening most of the outside of West Yorkshire, but it's just another way that we're doing it. And just a quick response to what Councillor Wadsworth says. I'm running lots of half-empty buses to Scarborough, and if everyone wants a day out on Coastline, we'd be very welcome to. OK, thanks very much, Alex. It was rather remiss of me not asking either Paul or Katie whether they wanted to come back following the answers from officers. Is there anything you wanted to pursue following that, either of you? Uh, nothing I want to pursue. Uh, it, it's, um, it's, it's good to hear that data is being used like that. I mean, I, I know having downloaded uh, the first bus app myself, which is the, it's the 56 and the 40 that are running around near me, um I, I i think it's it's really helpful so thank you and and the private car um data um i'm sure when when we whenever we can get some i'd be really happy in in, in seeing it okay thanks katie paul just to come back on, on the messaging i mean i mean i appreciate that we're struggling the messaging because it's changing from where it was last week to where it is now and where it might be next week i, I think you know, it, it's for everybody, probably more the combined authority, to really push that message in home because, I, you know, I, I was still unsure whether, you know, to use public transport for leisure is is something that is um, guidance or law or approved or what councillors should be doing because councillors should be ex doing exemplary behaviour, we are told to do. And it's it's that sort of level as to whether you think you should be doing and And the fact of vehicles being at capacity is another thing that does... You know, should you get out to Wakefield and then find you can't get back is just something that, you know, crosses your mind in these more difficult times. But I think it's just around forcing that message in home. Yes, and uh, we, we we are attempting to do that. I think that the, um, uh, and I will I will reflect the, the latest guidance that came through this week in, in what we, we put out. Um, I think my, my comment was more, this is a very noisy environment that we're putting messages out to uh, and people are getting uh, it, it, uh, and uh, are making their judgments based upon a, a lot of a lot of media talk around uh, around the pandemic generally. Um, so getting those messages, we can finally 
tone those messages in terms of, of what they send, say, getting them landed with people who who uh, who uh, in that in that fairly noisy environment of, uh, of, of, of chatter around the pandemic is quite difficult at the moment. Thanks very much, Dave. I mean, I have to say, does anybody understand any aspect now of the COVID regulations or restrictions? Uh, irrespective of whether they relate to buses or any other general aspects, it really is a very difficult situation. Um, Councillor Shazad, your, your hand has been up, down, up and down. Uh, are you wanting to ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, ap apologies. Fire chair. away. Uh, apologies, Chair. For some reason, uh, I think my buttons on my laptop are stuck today. And apologies for being late earlier on as well. I had to go in for a flu jab. So you're allowed to go in for a flu jab if you need one, Paul. Um, uh, what I was going to say is that... Uh, yeah, you're getting, this... you're getting free at my age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of them have to pay for them, though. Um, uh, what I was going, uh, going to say, with this new enhanced partnership, uh, as a council, we were looking to actually devolve uh, uh, buses into uh, public ownership. But would this new enhanced partnership allow us to provide bus services to those local areas that are not getting the bus services? Because uh, <clears throat> illegally, will we be able to ask uh, like First and, and, the, and Arriva and the other operators to provide those buses to those el elderly residents and to those residents that need them for short journeys from one local area to another? Like one of our buses, I think it used to run under, under the number 39, for me, would stopped and I used to run all the way through the Armley. And so that's all the business for the local areas that has been decimated because elderly residents and people that want to shop locally cannot get uh, access to a bus that pays into those local centres. Plus, again, uh, as C Councillor Dyer raised the point uh, regards uh, the uh, colour scheme, uh, w would there be a set pricing if you can travel all the way through on that colour scheme uh, so the pricing and everything becomes a lot more easier? And overall, uh, I, I want the opinion from Micah. Are they, are they looking at uh, uh, completely dismissing the idea of devolving bu buses back into public ownership? Or are they pushing forward towards this uh, uh, enhanced partnership now? And uh, uh, the, the other issue with this is, uh, well, with the statement that came out yesterday, uh, it will seem like uh, people will tend to want to travel back on, uh, on, 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 on their own personal vehicles, A, because of COVID, and B, the other reason being is this, is a lot of people were avoiding their own vehicles due to the climate concerns. And now if we're coming out with statements which are quite mixed, that the, no matter how much the use of the vehicles goes up, uh, we are not going to legally hit, uh, go over our uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, I think that's a bit of a wrong message, really, whereas uh, lots of people have had to, uh, me, myself personally, being a cab driver, I've, I've had to invest in a hybrid vehicle to make sure everybody like myself can breathe clean air. But now we're suddenly saying you could go out and get a diesel and it's not really going to make make an impact on the clean air zone. So, uh, it, uh, And I'm really uh, appreciative of the buses who are actually uh, uh, taking on, on board this clean air <clears throat> a strategy properly and they are actually investing in uh, electric buses and I really appreciate that and once again appreciate all the work that you've done through COVID. Sorry there's been lots of questions there Chair, I hope everybody picked them up. Okay thanks very much Mo and, and actually I'm going to use your questions which go beyond the sort of focus of COVID which was the, the starting point of this discussion to take us to page 18 of the agenda papers and to start going through some of the recommendations and the updates and, and our, our viewers to progress on them because certainly the wider issue that you raised about bus franchising um, is contained within that that wider report. So Dave, I don't know if you want to, to, to start off with responses to some of those questions um, and then anyone else who wants to wants to touch on them. Kim's waving, I, I, wave, wave, waving a real hand rather than a hand icon. So yeah, I'll bring you in, Kim, no problem. Okay. But Dave, I'll, would you like to start? I'll start and then Councillor Grove. So I think as, as I'll, I'll want it to come in on, on some of these issues. I think, um, yeah, I'm, uh, it's a, it, I think what we 
what we set out to do um, at, at roughly about the same time as the original inquiry, scrutiny inquiry for this, this committee, um, we, we at the Combined Authority and the members of the Combined Authority approved a bus strategy. Um, and that was back in 2017-18, where we sort of set out, what do we want out of buses? And, and from there on, we've been taking a step at a time approach to try and deliver that strategy. Um, and the first step was was uh, uh, around how we can uh, um, develop a, a partnership approach with, with bus operators so that we can basically get on and and deliver some of the the um, the, the, sh the shorter term and, and immediate benefits which we wanted to see from the strategy um, and so we established a, a, a initially something called bus 18 and then subsequently a bus alliance um, and I think that I think the discussion we've just had about COVID actually shows that the, the, the strength of that is that we have actually been able to work very closely together over the last six nine months um, to, to deal with the pandemic and the effect on buses and I Think that, that that shows where, where the, the partnership uh, has got strengths. I think um, we then need to, to th still think about that step at a time approach. Um, the next sort of level of that is 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 the enhanced partnership, which which we mentioned in the um, in the papers, and and that that's it. That, that's a much more uh, takes us that sort of collaboration to the next level in terms of sitting down with bus operators, with the council, with the combined authority planning and, and delivering a, a bus network um, uh, and working working together to do that in a, in a very in, in perhaps a more structured approach than, than we've we've done in the past um, as as we pointed out uh, and as council groves mentioned at the beginning um, as the combined authority becomes a mayoral authority then uh, it, uh, it it's in a position to um, to to move uh, and to, to, to adopt, should it choose to do so, um, powers to franchise bus services, which essentially is a contracting regime uh, where the, uh, the, the public body uh, issues contracts for the operation of bus services, uh, but also takes the financial uh, level of financial risk in doing so. Um, and I think it, obviously what, what we're pointing out here really is a, is a step at a time approach. We have a bus alliance at the moment. We, we, we want to move that into an enhanced partnership as part of a, of a managing ourselves out of of uh, and, and through the COVID recovery period, um, and and then see where that 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 takes us in terms of whether or not uh, the further step of of using the powers in the, the Transport Act uh, for franchising is ap appropriate. So I think I'll pass on to Councillor Groves there, but that's basically the the um, the structure behind what we're, we're seeking to do. Okay, thank you, Dave. <laughs> Obviously. We can remind ourselves that the policy of this council, Leeds City Council, is to pursue bus franchising as expressed through an all party supported uh, resolution of council some time ago. But Kim, yeah. please come in. In, in terms of, of the network, we've done a network review and I think when the connectivity strategy is um, it, it goes public probably around December time. It will show that we've looked at all those areas that are not served um, well, and it's the aim to grow the network. I think at West Yorkshire, I've made a point in terms of funding the government consistently that actually we don't have a mass transit system yet. We don't have a tram system like the other um, areas. So we are reliant on bus and the network has shrunk. Even in London, it's shrunk. So there's something fundamental wrong with the model and the funding um, to grow those networks um, and, and our ambition obviously is we want a clean, green, affordable and reliable bus service across West Yorkshire because so many people are dependent on it. We're up against uh, time, obviously COVID has set us back and um, we set a, a patronage growth of 25% uh, at Wyker. We've only got seven years left on that to deliver so we've got to go faster um, to, to get towards those, that ambition of, of delivering that 25% growth in patronage and obviously the pandemic um, has, has obviously had a massive impact. In terms of public ownership, obviously, you know, it, the government um, it, the government legislation, it, it's cumbersome and, and it's costly. So we've been, obviously, I've always said to the operators, it's never off the table, actually, at Leeds Council, we did say about franchising. To get to franchising, you've got to have a three-year process. You've got to be able to prove that partnerships haven't worked. 
Um, I think now what might happen in terms of um, we've obviously seen other areas um, going towards franchising um, and, and we'll continue to explore those options. But you would be looking back and presenting figures um, of a COVID year as well. Um, so I think that work will have to be revisited on franchising because that make a huge difference. So it, it, in terms of the day-to-day -day job, there's always, we're always looking at options but actually we need to deliver on the ground today, next week, next year. And we need a transport system that works for everyone. And the partnership is, 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 is what we're working towards. I mean, our current partnership with, with Operate has, has, has delivered many benefits, um, but we must go further and faster to achieve. You touched on the zero carbon. You're absolutely right. And, you know, in terms of West Yorkshire, we're probably leading, outside London, we're probably leading um, in the country, we'll probably definitely be in the, in the top five in, in terms of, of clean uh, buses, but we're not meeting those economic and social benefits. And um, through the operators, we're looking at employment sites, we're looking at housing developments, but with all the evidence that we've got back through the transport committee and all the elected members right across West Yorkshire have been involved, what we're going to be producing is a document that speaks to the people from the ground up and uh, hopefully you will see um, that the roots are there, we need the money and we need to have uh, our, our transport system heavily funded by government. So I'll leave it. I don't know if there's any more questions or if operators want to come in. Thank you. Thank you. No, th thank you, Kim. Well, before anyone else comes in, we're fortunate enough to have Councillor James Lewis with us, who is primarily here for the next agenda item, but of course he's our clean air guru, and I invite him to respond to Councillor Shazad's question about clean air and obviously to, to build on what Kim's already said. James. Uh, thanks, Chair. I heard uh, Councillor Shazad reference the clean air zone, so I thought I would um, um, thanks, Chair, for letting me just say very quickly where we are uh, on the clean air zone. I know I'm popping up on an item that's not mine, so um, I just want to say, first of all, in terms of the clean air zone, as, as, as people know, we took a, um, <clears throat> um, um, a, a, a U-turn yesterday. There's no other way to describe it in, in, in making the decision, having reviewed all the evidence, not to go ahead with the charging clean air zone. I think we looked at um, two sources of uh, data um, to make uh, that decision. And um, as people remember the clean air zone, we were instructed to do it by the national government. So... This is a joint review with them. It's not a decision we've made on our own. The two pieces of evidence we've looked at are, first of all, the um, air quality monitoring, which has been showing, actually, and um, for a period before lockdown started, um, that air quality at all the places we were monitoring in Leeds was below um, the level that was deemed illegal. Um, the second data we looked at um, showed that um, the share of vehicles on the road in terms of the vehicle categories that would be charged um, has um, a very high level of compliant vehicles. So um, as this is a buses item, we've gone from 2016 to having a, a few percent of buses being Euro 6 and compliant. Uh, we now have over 90 percent. And, and, and um, again, I put my uh, at this meeting on this item, put, put my thanks on, on record to the bus operators um, for making that. Um, 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 for making those changes, they've really made a difference. Again, it's uh, for HGVs, it's something like 20% um, to nearly 90% are compliant. And uh, as Councillor Shazad touched on from his, his own perspective, we've got um, of the uh, taxi and private hire vehicles licensed to Leeds Council, over 2,000 of the 5,000 are now uh, U level one description or another. So um, I'm very clear, you know, that. Um, some of that shift has happened because of the grants that we've made available. Uh, and I know um, some of the businesses and individuals have made the individual choices to do that. And we are, again, record our thanks to that. Uh, I think what I would say, though, is um, um, the legal. So although our decision not to in implement a charging zone started, um, the legal limits haven't changed. So um, and our monitoring won't change. So should there be a um, 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 a backwards shift in terms of the vehicle mix. Um, we do see um, either a, um, air quality deteriorating and the number of compliant vehicles going uh, reducing. Then we then we'll have to go back to the 
clean air zone. I, I mean, again, that hopefully um, that won't be the case. We have asked the government. Um, so in terms of the funding for the clean air zone, uh, we had um, an implementation fund um, to deliver it, but we also had a, a fund for vehicles of around 18 million. So far, we spent 7 million of that on grants and loans. Um, we've asked the government if we can keep a further 6 to 7 million of that so we can continue issuing um, grants to um, operators that want to, vehicle owners and operators that want to move over to a clean um, vehicle. Um, and also for taxi and private hire drivers, we'll pay uh, the Leeds Council licensing fees um, for all those drivers and uh, owners with a vehicle license to Leeds Council who moved over to a, a ULEV um, vehicle. Um, I know some taxi and private hire drivers are very angry um, about um, the position we've got in, but I know that some as well are have seen, with particularly with a hybrid vehicle, that the running costs um, are lower. So it, it, it's definitely ups and downs on that. Finally, um, we've never said that the um, air pollution limit written in um, the law is good enough. Uh, having believed we've achieved that, um, we will be bringing back work in the new year and obviously we'll be working with uh, Kim and the combined authority and all the vehicle operators about what some of the um, um, about what some of the next steps to see the continual improvement in air quality. We won't have the um, um, we won't have the, um, the clean air zone charges um, um, there as a, a um, as a tool because they are very much set by the national government around the legal level. But looking to do what we can do on a voluntary basis. So again, working like I say, we want to hopefully still have grants to vehicle operators. Some of the improvements like the park and rides that limit the number of people um, who drive into the city centre have made a difference again some of the ongoing improvements sorry chair that was quite a long answer to a very simple question but i thought it was worth saying as no no as but as i'm as sure as I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure i'm sure members will share my view that that was a very detailed and useful update on the situation i just wonder whether the information that you've given us is kind of updated in any way that could be circulated because obviously it's a lot to digest what you've what you've just told us um i would so the best plan for anybody who wants to uh, know more is obviously it, it's coming to exec board a week today. So the paper was published yesterday evening. So um, I'm sure we can have that circulated to all um, attendees um, to Fine. read it in more detail. OK, that's excellent, James. Thanks very much. Um, Andrew, you wanted to come in, I think, on these points. Uh, thank you, Chen. Can I just uh, thank... Uh... Councillor Lewis for the update on the clean air zone. So, Councillor Lewis, I, I work for CPT, the uh, the trade association. So, we've worked uh, very constructively with colleagues at Leeds City Council throughout, and I'm I'm pleased you've acknowledged the investment from uh, from operators. And also, I'd agree that we shouldn't take our eye off the ball. And earlier, I'd made the comment um, that we should be looking collectively at modal shift so uh, you may not want to look at hard measures to stop cars and also there's an excellent uh, park and ride scheme in, in Leeds which is uh, which has been built upon as well but I would also ask uh, in the longer term what softer measures uh, could be available uh, any of us could quite happily drive into Leeds city centre and park at a relatively reasonable rate so I would just put modal shift and what we can do collectively in the longer term uh, on the agenda. Uh, thanks, Chair. OK, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Councillor Suzanne, I'm going to ask if you want to come back briefly because I'm conscious of time and the fact that we've got officers and others awaiting our moving to the next agenda item. So, Mo, is there anything you want to come back on very quickly? Uh, no, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Lewis for his uh, uh, very well explained and expanded answer on the clean air zone. I okay. just hope that as a council that we carry on uh, pursuing that because I sit on the Climate Emergency Committee as well, so we need to keep on influencing a, a better clean air, air zone for okay. everyone. And uh, the other final question to, Quay, to Kim is, uh, to Councillor Kim Groves is, that uh, a lot of uh, our bus services are not going to where our key employers are and what, what are we doing about that, especially to the hospitals and, and to the universities. People, I mean, I know we've got the regular service from Headingley to the universities, but from the other areas, 
uh, you either have to catch two buses to get to the university or either two buses to get to any of the hospitals in the city. And I hope the uh, ongoing enhanced partnership that we're looking at getting into is going to improve that service because it's really needed. Thank you. When Is it possible we're, to have a yes or no answer to that? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're looking at it. We'll look at it. We'll come back to you, Councillor Charlotte. OK, thanks very much, Kim. Now, I'm going to let Councillor Neil Dawson come in, but then I've got to pull you back to going through the recommendations and the upgrade, uh, updates and our view on progress or otherwise. So I'm not going to allow any more questions other than perhaps on the points within that. Neil? Yes, thank, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think one issue that comes up in the papers, and it might be in the recommendations, but I'd like to bring up now is about, I think Councillor Shizad raised it, about zonal charging for bus services. And um, I think somewhere in the papers it refers to a meeting in January when this was to be discussed. I don't know if this was in next January or the January that's gone this year. Is it something that we are still pursuing as, as a combined authority and, th and the bus operators to have a zonal system or distance pricing for, for, for bus operations? Dave? Um, I think what the, uh, the papers might refer to is, is that we, we'll, we're, we're talking uh, and finalising arrangements with bus operators for a flat fare uh, or, a, or a simpler fare, shall we say, yeah. um, system for, for under 19s, um, where they, um, the combined authority directly subsidise the, uh, uh, the fares for, for under 19s and to uh, and basically get a structure that, that encourages more under 19s to travel um, and addresses the, the sort of affordability of, um, of that for them. Um, bus fares are set by by bus companies. Um, that's what the, the sort of legislation sets out. What we do do is work with the bus companies and the train companies on um, on the multi-operator, multimodal M-card uh, uh, tickets, um, which which are um, in some respects still at the moment across West Yorkshire rather than necessarily across the city. Um, but I think uh, Councillor Dawson makes, a, makes a, a strong point because I think I think we, we sort of alluded to it at the beginning. Um, we, we we emerge out of COVID into different different environment with probably more unemployment, um, uh, people viewing travel costs in a different way because they've been working from home for some of them. Um, and I think you know, we, we do need a fresh look at affordability and travel costs and what people are, are able to pay and how in particular how they do want to, to buy their travel. So I think this is all op open for, di for discussion, but at the end of the day, um, the, uh, the, the deregulated bus market puts, uh, doesn't put the public transport authority in a position of being able to set fares. Okay, thanks very much, Dave. Neil, do you want to come back on anything briefly? To just, well, thank you for the answer, but um, I think, I think one of, one of the barriers that for people who don't use buses is the complex nature of the, the fare structures, not knowing, you know, how much a journey may cost. So and I think that's understood by, by ourselves and bus operators. Yeah. Okay, right. I am going to move you on to page 18 onwards. Um, I think a lot of the issues that might have emerged from discussion of these individual recommendations has now been touched on as the discussion on COVID kind of mushroomed out into everything else. So recommendation one, um, I'm going to go through each of the recommendations. Shout up if you want to make any points or ask any questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to move straight, for, straight to the, uh, the position status. So recommendation one, um, the position status recommendation is that it's a four, in, in other words, that uh, adequate progress is being made and that we'll continue to monitor. But I think one of the main issues, i.e. that of bus franchising and the Bus uh, Services Act has, has already been explored. So is that OK? I'll take silence as acquiescence. Uh, moving on to uh, recommendation two. Again, the position status recommendation is four on that. Does anyone have any comments on it or questions? If not, um, recommendation three was previously achieved, although obviously 
the challenge of uh, congestion is an ongoing one so we'll obviously re revisit that not necessarily as part of the bus inquiry but possibly updates on on LTIP. Um, recommendation four again the suggestion here is that it's status four that okay a recommendation five um i have a number of questions but i think i'll rehearse these outside the meeting in order to save time but the recommendation is that that's a status four as well if that's okay we'll move on recommendation six Yeah, I mean, I think most of our discussions have touched upon this one anyway. That's the position status four, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah, okay. Recommendation seven, that's another four. Any other points on that, which we haven't already covered? Nope, okay. And uh, re recommendation eight, again, another four, if that's okay. And finally, recommendation nine. And again, the recommendation there is that's a four. Okay, if there are no other questions or comments arising from that, it just remains for me to thank everybody for their contribution, that our guests and obviously executive board members and Kim as chair of Wiker Transport Committee for their contribution, highly valued and uh, stay safe. So if you want to leave the meeting now, of course, we're more than happy for you to do so. Thank you, Chair. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, that moves us on to the uh, discussion about the budget. And of course, uh, members will be aware that this is quite a movable feast at the moment and that we had a working group a couple of weeks ago to examine the budget proposals that have gone to executive board at that time as we know this is an ongoing process that will take another couple of months and we'll be looking at it again um, in due course I was very keen that we should produce the notes from that working group discussion, which of course took place out of the public arena, so that they could be appended to the public agenda of this committee. And from, as I understand it, because there's been a bit of a game of musical chairs, um, Jill Stewart uh, is going to uh, start us off, but before she does, I obviously want to go through um, and ask officers to and others to introduce themselves. Um, so we've got Councillor James Lewis, who's already put in a, a shift on the previous item, but uh, James, if you'd like to just introduce yourself. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm officially here now. So good morning. I'm Councillor James Lewis. I'm one of the deputy leaders, um, executive board member for resources, um, which are for this group board includes asset management. Okay, thank you, James. And we've also been joined by Councillor Jonathan Pryor. Jonathan. Uh, morning, uh, I'm Councillor Jonathan Pryor. I'm the Exec Member for Learning Skills uh, and Employment. Um, I'm not sure if I've got a specific room to the board today, but um, I'm just here for fun, you know. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you, Jonathan. Um, Martin Farrington. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm Martin Farrington. I'm the Director of uh, city development and I, I actually think unless Jill wants to advise me otherwise I think I'm uh, going to do the initial uh, introduction uh, chair. Right that's fair enough I, I, I guess there would probably be another update to the update of the update that I'd received. Um, I've got Victoria Bradshaw on my batting order but I don't see Victoria unless she's appeared somewhere no okay Jill if you'd just like to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jill Stewart. I'm the Principal um, Finance Manager for City Development. OK, I've also got Simon Criddle down, whose acquaintance we made at the working group, but I'm not uh, sure if Simon Simon's here. On leave. Simon's on leave today, this week. Oh, uh, OK. Ah, uh, well, you're, you're coming off the subs bench. I don't mean that in any pejorative way. Um, Coral, have we got? No, it doesn't appear. So... Gary, yeah, we've definitely got Gary. Gary, I know you've introduced yourself previously, but if you'd like to do so again. 
Yeah, hi, Gary Bartlett, Chief Officer for Highways and Transportation. Staying on if uh, my director wants me to stay here. <laughs> okay. And then I've got Sue Wynn. Sue, you're definitely with us, aren't you? I am. Um, good morning, uh, Sue Wynn, Employment and Skills. Yeah, I've got Eve down on my list, but I don't see Eve. No, uh, Eve, okay, moving on. Your apologies, Chair. Okay, thank you. Phil Evans, we've definitely got Phil on. Phil, if you'd just like, like to introduce yourself. First person to not unmute themselves today. Uh, so I'm Phil Evans, I'm the Chief Officer for Operations in City Development, and I'm also coordinating the Directorate's work on savings. Okay, thank you, Phil. I've got Angela Barnicle down, but I don't think Angela is with us, is she? No. Um, Dave Feeney? I don't think... Good afternoon, Good afternoon everybody. David Feeney. Oh, hi, Dave. You've, hi, you've, I'm you, the Chief you, Planning Officer of Leeds. Keeping there. Thank okay, you. thanks very much. And Martin Elliott, don't see Martin. Is there anyone else whose name I've not read out? Okay. Right, Martin, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so the, uh, the item uh, um, as agenda item eight uh, looks at uh, the budget proposals that were brought forward um, to September's executive board as part of the budget setting process for uh, financial year 2021-22. Um, in those papers, it outlines uh, a budget gap of uh, nearly £190 million, which the council uh, needs to address in the, in the course of this uh, budget setting process. Um, in terms of context for city development, the city development directorate has a, a, a gross expenditure of 156 million pounds. Um, we also uh, generate significant amounts of income. So our, our current income in our budget is forecast to 118 million pounds a year. So that leaves um, a net managed budget for the service of 38 million pounds. Um, two um, observations I'd, I'd, I'd initially make on that. One is I think I'd recognize that particularly in the scale of the, um, the services that fall under the uh, directorate's responsibilities in, in this scrutiny board, um, highways and transportation is £18 million uh, net expenditure of, of that um, total £38 million. So highways is a significant proportion. And secondly, I, I think it, it is interesting context in terms of the £119 million total saving proposals for the council uh, with the, the net budget of city development at 38 million that that would mean city development um, budget being saved three times over and there'd still be five million required to achieve that 119 million so I think it's a it's a helpful context in in, in, in helping to uh, demonstrate the scale of the saving proposals that need to be brought forward um, and as a consequence of that we've looked at all parts of the directorate's operations to ensure that the directorate uh, can bring forward uh, savings proposals that meet the required targets so we can contribute towards that 119 million pound gap. So within the uh, papers that you've got, there are a uh, saving, a, a, a range of saving proposals that have been brought forward. And if, if, I, if I briefly go through them, the first one is um, savings from reduction in the council's core office base and that's that scheduled at £236,000. I'm not clear Chair, whether asset management falls in this scrutiny or resources scrutiny but I'll raise it here and then if there are any questions we'll, we'll be able to answer them. And then uh, in terms of asset management and regeneration there's also staffing savings through voluntary means um, and other expenditure savings that are outlined at um, £700,000 and general reductions in expenditure budgets, such as consumables and training, uh, and increased capitalisation of staff costs, and collectively that has £350,000 set against it. In terms of capitalisation of staff costs, we do a lot of project management of, of capital schemes, large capital schemes. A lot of them are often externally funded, 
Um, and we are we have reviewed whether or not uh, we are recharging at the right rates, and is there any scope to increase that uh, in line with um, comparators? And we feel we feel that there is. Um, then, in terms of markets and city centre uh, services, uh, proposals to bring forward staff reductions through the deletion of vacant posts, also uh, voluntary uh, ELI early leavers uh, proposals general expenditure reductions and some areas where we want to make targeted increase in income. But I think we have to look at that in the context of the current economic uncertainty, but collectively we're forecasting £200,000 there. Um, on the employment and skills side, um, staffing reductions uh, through the deletion of uh, vacant uh, senior management post um, and reductions in research and evaluation budget. And that, that is targeting a saving of £100,000. Then in planning and sustainable development, we're looking at uh, staffing reductions through voluntary means. Also areas where we feel we can increase income and general expenditure and uh, budget reductions, looking to save £350,000. In highways and transportation, uh, looking to bring forward savings of £900,000 through the use of balances arising from development agreements and also reviews of uh, our, our current charges that we make. Um, and then the other areas in that list is business as usual. Uh, I won't cover because they sit outside of uh, uh, this board. Um, and then uh, just going down, bear with me. If I tab down to um, service reviews, we have service reviews uh, in the uh, City Development Directorate. Uh, one is in economic services and looking at areas of uh, operation there through staffing reductions on a voluntary basis uh, in the, uh, uh, and looking at potential restructure of our economic policy team. Uh, ceasing membership of business in the community, uh, stopping or reducing our attendance at MIPIM. I think that there is a big question of uncertainty as to whether that will take place in March next year. Uh, and reductions in travel and numbers of uh, staff attending events, which is forecasting 110,000. Uh, proposals to uh, look at the options from the service review of strategic planning with a, a forecast saving of 100,000. And then a forecast saving of uh, £1.62 million pounds, uh, through review of uh, staffing operations uh, in highways and transportation uh, and uh, additional income and savings targets that we, that we can bring forward uh, in the highways budget. So collectively, Chair, that covers uh, the range of services and there are Chief Officers uh, Phil Evans, Sue Wynn, uh, David Feeney and Gary Bartlett, which will be able to help in answering any detailed questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that roundup, uh, Martin. I don't know if any of the officers want to add anything to that before I throw it out for comments and questions from members. Okay, do any members of the board have any questions over and above, well, not over and above those that we raised in the working group, because obviously this is the public part of our deliberations, although obviously what we discussed in the working group is on record through the notes that uh, that very, uh, Becky very quickly compiled for us. Um, if, if there aren't, I would just like to go back to some of the discussions and touch on them in this public part of the meeting. I think some of the concerns that were expressed about the measures related to planning and highways, and I think the planning ones related to the business as usual loss of staff, and would that enable um, plans to continue to deal with issues raised within the community, either directly or by councillors, because obviously um, we do receive from time to time quite a lot of input from local communities and individuals about various planning applications. And I think we have noticed, certainly in my ward over time, that it becomes more and more difficult to, to get responses to our queries. And we do appreciate that there are fewer people working under even more pressure, even prior to COVID. So I think we do make allowances, and but we'd not want that to get any worse in terms of 
responding to those issues and also responding to issues of enforcement, which I know, again, from talking to some members uh, throughout the city, is a concern. Uh, I think one of the questions that was raised, and perhaps Dave could put a little bit more flesh on the bones of what we discussed in the working group, about our capacity to respond to changes in the planning system, um, which would be quite significant, and I think probably means starting the whole laborious process off once again with all that entails. And obviously, I'd want to reiterate the point that was raised by members about highways and to seek reassurance that highways officers will be able to be responsible for local concerns, responsive to local concerns expressed either by the public and or uh, local members, because that is one area where over time, I think a lot of uh, elected members across the board have felt there have been some question marks. So, Dave, I don't know if you want to start off with the questions relating to planning capacity and then, Gary, if you could pick up the point about highways. Thank you, Chair. Just in relation to, to the issues you've raised, I mean, sort of planning capacity more generally, um, just to reiterate the point, which I'm sure you and other members and other colleagues on the call are aware of, we're a very busy service. We deal with a very high level mm. of planning applications, over 8,000 a year um, and at the moment we've been dealing with obviously the changes as a consequence of, of the pandemic doing things differently to maintain the service and service continuity in, in parallel with that we've also had an ongoing series of changes around planning reform some of those changes have just been introduced without any consultation some of the changes are subject to shorter periods of consultation and other reforms are, are subject to longer periods of consultation so I think at the moment we're still um, understanding in totality what those changes will mean but as a general principle I think we want to maintain our service in terms of being agile and resilient to these changes to make sure that the service we provide is fit for purpose albeit within a more constrained financial environment so in terms of dealing with um, a couple of the points you've, you've raised chair about sort of inquiries and requests and a number of strands to that we get a lot of inquiries with regard to planning applications as part of consultation on planning applications and we also get a number of inquiries in relation to plan making a very high level of response to for example the site allocations plan so, so we're managing those processes on a day-to-day -day basis as part of that consultation in terms of enforcement that you've mentioned again you will be aware chair as, as will other uh, members and colleagues on the call that at any one time I think we have something like a thousand cases uh, underway or, or active or being dealt with within the service and I think it's fair to say that during the the lockdown period we've had a flurry of further requests in relation to the need to look at um, issues on, on the ground in terms of um, potential bre breaches to, to planning planning conditions etc but our general approach here is to make sure we can maintain a continuity of service but operate in a way which is more efficient of our time and one of the things we are looking at through the service reviews we've done is how can we engage more in terms of front loading in terms of planning applications and also the plan making process so that would enable engagement in those processes at the earliest stage which would therefore hopefully enable applications and the plan making side of planning to, to run more smoothly and, and broadly that approach is consistent with the government's thinking in relation to um, planning reform that there are various proposals around um, early engagement in planning and also better use of digital technology. So at the moment, it isn't fully clear what some of the government proposals mean in practice, but I think through the service reviews, we want to ready, ready ourselves for those changes and to take the necessary steps at this stage to make sure we can continue to be an agile and resilient service, which is delivering on the Council's priorities, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Gary. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, v very similar to David, really, in terms of y you and me the members here will be very aware that uh, demand for our services, particularly in traffic engineering, outstrips supply that we're able to offer, really, in terms of um, officer time and, indeed, um, finances to actually implement things on the ground. But we do try to prioritise. Certainly, the, the current... Uh, uh, financial crisis means that we get, we're having to review our structures um, and that's given us an opportunity to um, develop some ideas that we do need to talk to our executive member uh, about and uh, that's something we plan to do in the next few weeks. Um, that to do. We're, we're very acutely aware of uh, concerns expressed by members about uh, communication uh, and so uh, that, that has guided us in our thinking. So um, I think bear with us, um, but as I say, it, it does come from a starting point. Have to be realistic here that certainly demand for our services uh, currently far outstrips the supply, um, and I, I can't see that demand dropping off any. Uh, and, and with more constraints on resources, it's going to be difficult. But we we are looking at uh, new ways of doing things to improve communication as well. Um, um, but those ideas are in formulation, and we'll be talking to our executive member in the next couple of weeks. Okay, thank you, David and Gary. I mean, it's reassuring that those considerations are at the forefront of thinking. But I mean, don't get me wrong; this is not any attempt to 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 oppose what is a reality that's been thrust upon us. I mean, obviously, I've I've had a connection with this authority since I was first elected as a councillor in 1982, and then as a an MP and now again as a councillor and I think it's fair to say that previous governments Tory and Labour I'm not making any distinction have been less than generous over the years in terms of their local government settlements but that pales into insignificance compared to what's happened over the last 10 years and I think I think the figure I'm sure it's gone up since I last stirred it but uh, maybe uh, in due course James can confirm this that we've lost something like 1.7 billion in grants and things were already pretty dire uh, but unfortunately it would seem that the further extension of our deficit and the savings that we're having to find caused by loss of income through covid and extra expenditure through covid without wanting to be too apocalyptic is converting a crisis into a potential catastrophe in terms of local government services here in leeds and and beyond um, so as I say, it's not it's not saying these are the wrong things to do, but it's just seeking reassurance that, you know, the fact that we're here to serve the public as elected members and officers is still at the forefront of our mind, despite the enormous financial pressures and constraints. Uh, Councillor Neil Dawson, you wanted to come in. Uh, thank you, Chair. Two issues. Um, the, the first, I think, is looking at some of the, the detail in the tables, um, car parking charges. I mean, given what's happened this year in terms of car parking and the impacts on the city centre, is it realistic to expect additional income from car parking? I mean, particularly the one around Woodhouse car park and the daily commuter charge going up. I mean, are we, are we sure we'll even have the daily commuters coming into Woodhouse car park? And my second issue, Chair, is I mean, it's not to do with city development, but I noticed under communities, there's a suggestion we may reduce our grant to Leeds City Credit Union. And it's just a concern that this is an organisation that helps some of the poorest people in our city and um, is much needed in a time of financial crisis for many people. So I'm, I'm just very wary of putting forward that as a, as a reduction in our, you know, in our grant to the Leeds City Credit Union. And do we know what the impact of that will be? Thanks, Neil. I think that, that second question does slightly move beyond our remit, but that doesn't in any way yeah. you know, reduce the importance. I have to say, I've got a vested interest. I helped to set up the credit union 30-odd um, years ago. Um, but I think I'll let James chip, chip in and just uh, you know, extend a little bit of latitude on that. But, uh, Gary, do you want to come in on the, uh, on the parking? Uh, the car off street car parking doesn't actually fall under my remit, so um, oh, okay, Martin. So, whoever pitch in, sorry, Martin. Well, I was gonna say the car parking charges falls under communities and environments directorate, so it's, it's part of their budget 
proposals. I think I think by by way of context, the um, the council is a, a minority provider of uh, off street car parks in the city. So any 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 proposals that the council does bring forward would have to be benchmark benchmarked with what the private operators um, charge to make sure it's competitive. And uh, you know, I think there is a a clear point that the councillor Dawson makes about uncertainty and and demand, which would have to be carefully considered. But those are all matters that I'm sure the city, the, the communities and environments directorate will 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 consider and uh, as it's brought forward through through to members for final resolution. Okay, I think councillor Dawson can be forgiven because we have had colleagues from car parking uh, at the board in, in the past. But obviously, terms of reference do change over time. Uh, Neil, are you still indicating that you want to come back? No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Uh, just, okay, I'm, so Neil. yeah, go on. No, I was just going to say, what, what was was James going to respond on the credit union? Yeah, as 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 we've got him here, James. Thank you. Um, on the credit union, um, I think there's a couple of things. I think, firstly, um, most of the money that the credit union handles is its members' money. Um, obviously, we give them mm. uh, grants towards a number of initiatives. They are um, looking, I know um, they're looking at some organisational changes um, and they're looking at, um, which I won't speak to because I don't know too many details, but I don't um, believe it affects, like I say, the uh, um, um, their mainstream um, operations. We they operated for uh, many years um, um, without council support. I believe um, we helped them over a um, uh, a um, rocky patch. Um, but like I say, I think they are their principal business is, is you know and their principal financing comes from their uh, um, own members' money through like I say the um, uh, sort of the operation of a credit union. What I'll do is. Um, I will um, dig out the details of that for you, Neil, just so you can have um, some more details on, on those. Um, on the car parking one, I think there is a, a broader issue about all the areas of the council. So obviously, uh, without going through local government class 101, the basics, you know, we're funded by local taxes, what's left of government grant and um, um, money that we raise ourselves from fees, charges and services. I think in attempting to set a budget for 21-22 financial year. So um, anything to do with fees, charges and services is really difficult to predict. And I think any figure we put in there in any part of the council, um, we're doing it. Uh, we may, when we actually come to finally set a budget in next February, um, we may have a better idea of where the land lies on some of this stuff. But, you know, we always on, on the budget, we're sat here, trying to predict every year we're sat almost trying to predict what's going to happen 18 months in advance because that's the end of the following financial year I think as you've um as you pointed out Councillor Dawson this year it's just hard on, on like I say those fees charges and services it's it is just harder than ever um to do that and, and like I say as we get closer to the budget in February on all of those we'll be looking at sort of refining um, um refining our position OK, thanks very much, James. So in the absence of any other indications or questions or comments, I'll draw this agenda, agenda item to a close and thank all the officers for their attendance and the executive board members for their responses. I'm going beyond the call of duty in the case of Councillor Lewis. Thank you, everyone. OK, moving on to the final substantive item, the, uh, the work programme. I think, as always, this is just an item for noting there aren't any particular things that I need to draw to your attention, other than perhaps reminding everybody that we did agree to a working group on the government's new planning proposals, which will take place on the 21st of October, where I hope to see as many of you as possible, given your other commitments. OK, so thanks very much, everyone, for your attendance and your contributions. I think, as always, we've had some really good discussions, particularly on the bus service uh, review and the current pressures caused by COVID. So thank you again, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.